listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I got to tell you something, people. The last time my guest was on my show was six years ago. And she had was in the early stages of working on a documentary that came out that she directed called The Human Race. And I saw it came out. I was She was starting to do interviews back then. It was a fascinating story. And she was just on the uh, two-part season finale of... NCIS LA, and I know she's out there marching with the uh, strikers, and uh, my guess is Liz Vassie. How you doing, Liz? Hi, I'm doing really well. How are you? Good. What's What's the feeling out when you're marching? Because, you know, I live back east now, and I'm not allowed a lot of entertainers, but I tell them, you know, writers are so important. I mean, it's like the other night watching the last episode of Ted Lasso. It was amazing writing. It was just great writing. And some people are like, oh, well, they can do it with AI. I'm like, no, no, you don't get it. I'm like, you know, you're a businessman. Okay, you don't understand the creativity process. But what's the feeling on the lines? Because you've written us, you wrote a script for uh, NCIS years ago, right? I mean, CSI. For CSI. Yeah. For CSI. And since then, um, after I wrote that script, I, I've sold eight pilots. I mean, I've been I've been focused on writing. First of all, thank you for saying what you said. Uh, I really appreciate it. There, one of my favorite signs out there on the picket lines, there's a sign that says, AI doesn't have childhood trauma. And I just love that <laughs> because one of the questions executives invariably ask when you're trying to pitch something to them, they say, why you? Why are you the one to tell this story? And so suddenly... To go from that, the juxtaposition between that and suddenly having computers write it, it's like, wait a second, you want to make sure that we are personally involved in this story and that we can draw from our own lives, or you want AI to do it? It just doesn't make much sense. And I mean, some of the shows that are on TV right now, uh, all the ones that have just ended recently, Maisel, Succession, Ted Lasso, Barry, those are very human. And the reason that they've hit is not because it, they, they all have excellent plotting. They all have excellent characters, but it's the humanity, you know, particularly Ted Lasso. So um, the feeling out there is uh, one of solidarity like I've never seen before. I mean, I marched in 2007 at the uh, uh, previous strike and I was um, working on CSI. And of course, that was halted. But um I marched with the writers, with our writers uh, at Universal. It's a different feeling this time. Uh, it's a significantly different feeling. I think the stakes are higher. I think we learned from the last strike. And I think that uh, a lot of things, it's been a decade for me focusing on writing and a lot of things have changed hugely during that period of time, like the advent of mini rooms, as opposed to MI and I uh, rooms, pioneer rooms where fewer people are hired, uh, especially fewer writers that are working their way up. It's more executive level writers like, you know, executive producers and producers. So a lot of people are having a hard time breaking in. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the orders are smaller. So it's 10 episodes versus 22, but you're tied to that show and it's not enough to get through the year. Uh, and streamers, you know, are claiming that they don't have the money to pay people the proper amount of residuals, which, you know, is bullshit. And no, nobody's asking for things that, that aren't completely deserved. And it all starts with the writing. And I, I felt that far before I even tried writing myself. So, um, but it's hope, you know, there's hopeful things well, out there. Well, then on the other side also is now that the side might strike. So you're sitting there, you're, you have like a double whammy for you because you do both. Now, <laughs> now, I mean, when you think about it, why is, I, I've, I've read, you know, on pay, Facebook with some of the actors how, once again, the streamers, actors get screwed you know hbo can show whatever they want on hbo max or whatever and you guys aren't getting paid but what's the feeling like that is that something when when you're you're a working actor and writer is it scary because this is what you do and it's like anything like when COVID happened we never thought it'd be two years you know what is it like what is it like for someone like you who is in both camps first of all i hope we both uh strike i hope sag does strike because i think it's only going to help um, I, I think, you know, the more people that are clamoring for what's fair, the better. I think what a lot of people take from this, uh, there's a misconception that writers and especially actors are asking for the moon. Um, they're not. They're asking to be able to support their families. They're asking for health insurance. A lot of people don't know that the only way to qualify for health insurance through our unions is to earn a certain amount. So residuals can make a huge difference. Residuals can make the difference between being able to insure your family for a year and not. Um, so I I was on uh, one of the dinosaurs of big shows, you know, they just don't exist the way that they used to. So CSI, I've been fortunate enough to make residuals for years after that. And sometimes that did make the difference for whether or not I got insurance. And that's a big deal in this country, 
particularly. And um, so uh, now, all of a sudden, I, I, you know, I've had friends on streaming shows, big streaming shows, who haven't qualified for insurance because of the way that their uh, series orders were split up. So like half of them were shot in one year and half the, the next year. So they didn't make insurance, yet they're starring on shows. It, it's just, it's not what a lot of people outside the business think. Um, so again, you know, this is not about owning luxury yachts. This is about uh, good schools for kids, you know, insuring your family and just, just uh, putting food on the table. <laughs> it's about making a living. Now, you've, you've worked a lot. What made you shift more to the writing? I mean, you know, I mean, I want to talk about NCIS uh, LA because that must have been so fun. The season finale of a show, I mean, a series finale of a show that's been on forever. But what made you want to do that shift? You said about eight years ago, you, you, you focused more on writing. Was it just you were tired? Because, I mean, I look at your resume. I mean, you were, you were like three episodes of the new Leave at the Beaver. I mean, you've been acting for a long time. You've been acting since your teens. What made you want to make the shift? Well, I started acting when I was nine, actually, in theater. Um, I, <clears throat> I had, I had E. coli poisoning when I was two, and I went in the hospital for a long time. And when I came out, I was, uh, I'd gone in very extroverted, and I came out very wary of people. You know, it was, was shell shocked. I had PTSD from being in the hospital as a, as a child. And the only thing that made me feel like me years later was getting up on stage, um, saying somebody else's words, ironically. But a, a lot of actors end up saying that. You know, I, I felt at home. So uh, theater saved me. It gave me a life as a kid. It gave me a place to belong. Um, and then I went from that to television. I did the new Leave it to Beaver when I was 15. I did All My Children when I was 16, moved to New York. And I'd been acting a long time. And, um, you know, a couple things. Like, uh, I ended up, after five years uh, on CSI, we, we parted ways. Then I was on Two and a Half Men. I was going to stay for a little while longer. Some things obviously very publicly went wrong there on that set. And so suddenly my character wasn't needed anymore. I screen tested for a show that I really wanted. I didn't get it. And so I just thought, you know what? I need to give myself, even if it's an illusion, I need the illusion of more control in my life. So I sat down and wrote a pilot and I ended up selling it. And I had never been more ecstatic about uh, about a job really because I created it on my laptop. And so after that, I thought, well, I'm going to do this again and I want to do this again. So it just felt like another way to be creative that I hadn't been doing for decades and decades and decades. And quite honestly, I needed the break because then going back first on a million little things, um, DJ Nash, who created that show has been a friend of mine for years. And he basically dragged me back onto television. So I'm grateful that he did, but I had fun. And it was the first time that acting had been fun for a while. So I needed to step away and do something else that still fueled the creative fire, but wasn't quite the same. Well, it's funny. I was going to ask you, but since you weren't really acting, and you know the whole thing about auditioning on on tape or video, and I know a lot of actors hate it because a lot of people live for the room. But you know, it seems like you got an offer for pretty lot of million little things, and then probably NCIS. But have you done any auditioning since you started writing? Have you actually had to do any Zoom auditioning? Yeah, I've done uh, I've done a lot of auditions on tape over the last uh, well, even before that. My husband is a cinematographer and a cameraman, so to be perfectly honest, I am in the I am in the vast minority of people. I'm fine not going in the room. I'm truly fine. I understand why people want to, and uh, I liked the room. I was good in the room. I mean, you get good after 30 years of doing it. You, I hope, um, but it, it was really easy. I'm in a very very fortunate position because. Um, you know, short of a wind machine, like my husband does all the lighting. This is his job. So it is uh, substantially easier for me to do self tapes than a lot of people. And again, I get why it's difficult for a lot of people too. Um, but I actually got CSI based on a tape uh, first because I had screen tested for 15 pilots one year and walked away with one that I knew wasn't going to go. I had a good time doing it. I just wanted to hold the pilot by the end of it. And this is what this is. A long time this is like 2005 and i thought i don't know that i want to do this anymore i'm tired of this grind of going into rooms and so csi i knew the casting director and they kept calling saying we think you're perfect for this role of wendy and i read the original description and i thought no i'm not and i'm not going in that room because i can't get told no again i'm very i just don't want to do this so i put myself on tape and luckily that tape got their attention and it ended up turning into a recurring which ended up turning into a series regular um, so, you know, I, I did it before all the COVID stuff too. And I've done one Zoom audition. I got very close to being on a series about two years ago and I had to do a Zoom audition and 
I prefer the self tapes to the Zoom auditions. That I found a little weird. Uh, and uh, definitely prefer the in room to the Zoom auditions. But you know, you do what you got to do. I think it'll all come back to normal. I think it'll. I think it'll be an option soon for people to do the rooms or the tapes. Or you know, I think it's just open the playing field a bit. I got to ask you, as someone who as someone who started out when they were nine, how did you end up on a soap opera? Because you know, you were back when soap operas were huge. I remember we used to watch soap operas in college. You know, we would sit there if you didn't have a class, like all the guys would get in one room, and, and we just loved them. You know, it was like days of our lives was crazy back then. All my children, you know, Luke and Laura, all that crazy stuff. But how did you end up on the soap opera? Because it's 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 just something that you know to be sixteen on you know, a soap opera's got to be a little. It's got to be a little overwhelming. It, it was actually, it was perfect. Um, I had done musical theater growing up, like mostly musical theater, and I thought that I was going to be on Broadway. That's what my goal had been as a kid. So one summer I went up with my extremely supportive mother and uh, some family friends who also had a kid who wanted to be on Broadway. We went up, we stayed in an apartment in Manhattan. I fell in love with it the moment we landed. Like I thought I need to live in this city. And uh, I started auditioning. I got a national tour of Evita, but I couldn't do it because I needed to stay in school. I was going to play the, the, there's a role of a mistress with one song called Another Suitcase in Another Hall. And uh, I couldn't do it, which was devastating, but I needed to go finish school so I could get out of school and move to New York. And in the midst of that, uh, I got a manager. So this manager was calling me and I, I would fly. I remember one time at 15, I flew alone. My mom was frantic, but I flew alone to Manhattan, met my sister's friend who took me to an audition, got me back to the airport, flew back. And I never was scared because again, I've, I've never felt so at home in my life as I had in New York. I still feel that way. I just love that city so much. So then I got the audition for all my children and I thought, okay, you know, I'll go and I'll, I'll audition. And then they called me back to audition again. And then uh, without going too deeply into this, but my parents ended up getting divorced in the midst, right in the midst of this. So my mom and I didn't know what we were going to do or where we were going to live or what the next step was. And then I got this screen test for all my children and then I got it. So my mom and I moved from our home in Tampa. Uh, my grandmother came along for the ride. We moved from Tampa to Hell's Kitchen and we lived in this tiny, tiny, tiny one bedroom apartment you know, with all of our beds practically head to head, these three women, three generations, and we lived there together. So it was, aside from being incredible training in front of a camera, aside from being able to take acting classes in New York, aside from the way that it changed my career in ways that, you know, were just uh, absolutely life-changing, it also changed everything about the trajectory of uh, my family's existence, you know? Like, it, it just, it saved our lives. So... It was funny, I met, a, I met a woman that I beat out for that role years later, and she was talking about how much she wanted it. <laughs> and I was like, I gotta tell you, I'm sorry, but we needed it. <laughs> like, you can have the next one. I'm sure we'll go up against each other. It's all cyclical, but that one had to be my role because it, it definitely saved us. Now, what is it like on the set for the soap opera? Because you, you think you shoot almost every day, and, and you have to learn, like, when you... When you want to get into a character, and I'm sure when you do auditions, you have time, like, you know, your husband's a cinematographer. For now, he can do a bunch of shots, and he can do this, and you can take your time, and you can say, okay, we can shoot at 2 in the morning if we need. But at a, for a soap opera, and at a young age, you know, we're all, our attention spans are very short at a young age. What was it like when you had to sit there and you go, okay, I have to learn all this stuff for tomorrow? Was it, was it hard, and has it helped you? with learning lines in the future. Because I can't remember, I, I do stand-up occasionally. I did a show a few weeks ago at City Winery in Philadelphia, and I had to take, like, notes up. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't remember it, and I'm only up there for 25 minutes. But what, what was it like for you to, and how did you get that muscle in your mind to remember all those lines? Um, it was heaven. I just, you know, I was living exactly what I dreamed of doing, which was being a professional actor. So, it was, it was heaven. I don't even remember it being difficult. I just, I mean, first of all, you're 16, so your mind is incredibly squishy and malleable. And like, it's just, it's not as hard as it, as it is when you get older, but 16 years old, like I graduated from high school. It's not like I was taking biology on the side. So I just, this was my job and I took it very, very seriously. And I don't recall anybody ever I mean, some of the older actors, to be perfectly honest, I remember one person 
and it was just really quite genius, but he would write his lines down on the bottom of props. So you'd see him and he looked like he was being so pensive and he'd pick up something off the ground and then he'd be look at it while he was talking. He's reading his lines. And now I look at it and go, okay, you know, dude's 70 years old. That's a, more power to him. But it, uh, it wasn't difficult at the time. And it didn't feel like work just because I realized even then, and part of that was just the way I was raised. I knew I was breathing rarefied air and I knew I was really lucky to be there. So I sure as hell wasn't going to screw it up. And uh, it made it much easier later in life. Like the shit just sticks. Like I did a pilot years ago and I can tell you that one of the lines that I had was (laughs) collapse the schematic of the HDV rod structure with a Wang numbering system. And it sticks (laughs) from so many years ago. So it it did something to my brain and my husband laughs because I, you know, I like the NCIS episode had a lot of jargon. But I, I run it and I run it and I make sure it's in my brain. And it, it is a muscle that I've been exercising my whole life. So I'm actually grateful that that job made me good at it. Now, when you're 16, you're on a hit show, a soap opera. They have huge followings. I've had soap opera stars on the show. And, and like every old woman in Wisconsin would follow when they tweet like, oh, and Tal Penglis was on. Oh, you know, they have soap operas have them in Star Trek or like the people that follow. What's it like? Because you probably started getting noticed everywhere because it wasn't like there's all the TV on now. Back then, it was like, you know, soap opera. I think maybe Oprah, maybe Phil Donahue. There was, everyone had their eyes on it. Was it, what was it like for you at that young age? Because we're, we're young, you know, we're getting a little cockiness, I'm guessing. I mean, was it, was it weird for you? Um, there was definitely no cockiness. Like, I, honestly, when I say that I, I, I was raised by the perfect mom for this, like my mom made it very clear to me that the attention that I was getting was because of the job, not because of who I was. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it, it, there wasn't, there really truly was no cockiness. The thing is, I'm really grateful that I lived in that world then because what there was my father was a minister, so what there was was a huge time in New York. I mean, everything that most kids did in high school, I did several years later. So all the rebellion, all the partying, all the going out. So I'm very glad there wasn't Twitter then. I was very glad that people weren't video. I mean, I, I lived large, and I regret nothing. It was fantastic. So uh, I, I am happy that that didn't happen. I mean, the other thing is that it's a very... Uh, it's a very myopic type of, of fame because I could walk into a room of a hundred people and maybe five would freak out and be like, Oh my God, it's Emily Ann. And 95 would be like, who? And so you also realize that, you know, a lot of the people out there have no idea who you are and the ones that do are the people that follow the show. And you know, it, it's, it's easy to keep, it was for me, it was easy to keep a pretty level head about it um one of the one of the coolest things though some of the fans of the shows were big actors like carol burnett was a huge fan of all my children so one day i walk into work and carol burnett is there and she sees me and goes oh my god it's emily (laughs) and i just remember at the time going oh my god i can't believe you know anything about me or carol burnett so that was kind of cool that was it was really nice to be appreciated by people that i revered now, what happened with all my children? Did you get written off? Did you leave? I and mean, what? Because the soap operas? You... Uh, I was canned. I mean, you know, it's what happens. First of all, you get on the show, and oh, what a lot of people don't know, at least at the time, contracts are set up where they have the option to get rid of you every six weeks. I remember my poor mother, because like I said, we moved from Tampa to New York, so we're living in this apartment, and she would page through the scripts, and I now know she was looking to see if there was like a bus crash or something where I would die every six weeks, you know, just to make sure that I was still contracted to be on there. So I did two years, and then at the end of two years, they have an option to keep you or give you a pay bump. Everybody in my storyline had either been fired or quit. So it was at the point where I was sort of there alone. There was nothing to do with me. And uh, I remember very specifically, I was going to a charity event and I was like a costume thing. I was dressed as a cheerleader and Kelly Ripa was my dressing roommate at at All My Children. And I think she was dressed like a cheerleader too. I think that's how we chose to dress for this, which is just funny because neither one of us are very cheerleader like at all. (laughs) But I remember I was called into the executive producer's office in a cheerleading outfit and told that I was fired, uh, which is just, which is sort of, you know, (laughs) raw. Um, But uh, yeah, and 
look, I, it hurt at the time. And then I knew I wanted to move to California. And um, since then, since being in a business for 107 years, I, I don't know one single person who hasn't been in this business and been fired, uh, if not one time, multiple times. Like, you know, it just it happens. Well, you know, you look at it. And it's actually a blessing because, you know, I look at your IMDb. I mean, you were a murder, she wrote. And I heard if you were going to episode of that with, I mean, who was it? One, I don't know, it was Stephen Weber or someone told me that, like, Angela Lansbury loved actors. Like, she was so great. Like, she would fight for, you know, to get more money. But what is it like when you walk in and you, you work with someone who's a legend, and but she's also so nice and so supportive? It must have been really cool, especially when you're young and you're thinking, wow, this person has been acting for, I mean, I don't know how old she was then. She's old. I, she's still, I don't even know if she's still alive. But what was it like working with someone like that? Uh, you know, it's funny you ask that because I was just talking about this with my husband last night. Um, I was incredibly flattered to be able to do it. I ended up doing, I think I did two episodes and she, she, if she liked somebody, she made sure they came back. And, and the other thing she did, which I love, I found it much later, she would hire some of her older friends who were having trouble meeting the, the level of income for insurance. So getting back to what we talked about before, she would make sure that her friends could be insured by giving them guest spots, which is like just an incredible thing to do. Uh, she was very kind. I mean, you forget in a moment, like you meet her and it's, oh my God, it's Angela Lansbury. And, and then she's such a normal human being and it's such a delight to work with that you kind of forget. Um, but I was talking about that with my husband and diagnosis murder. We were talking about this last night because we just rewatched The Elephant Man and uh, Anthony Hopkins, of course, is in that. And he had come by the set on diagnosis murder when I was working on there to visit his friend Dick Van, Dick, Dick Van Dyke. So Anthony Hopkins was on the set and I got to meet him. And I, I was telling my husband, it was so incredible to have Dick Van Dyke bring you over and introduce you to Anthony friggin' Hopkins. So, um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't lost on me as, as a kid. It's probably better that it happened to me when I was so young because I hadn't seen enough of their work to truly be starstruck. I just had known that they were legends, but not in a sort of personal way. Like, I, I ended up doing Fantasy Island, and I hadn't... Um, it, Malcolm McDowell was the lead. It was the reboot of Fantasy Island. And I hadn't seen Clockwork Orange at the time. And so I worked with him and had a great time with him. Went home, watched Clockwork Orange, and thought, oh, thank God I hadn't watched that first. Like, it was so nice to just meet him and not really know. Clockwork Orange, this is no lie. When I was in college, it was playing on my campus. And I took, I, I, never, I, I never remember what it was about. And I, I took a girl on the first date to Clockwork Orange. Not what you call, even, I don't think me and my wife would watch it. It's not what you call a date movie but i still but he was so amazing in that and so intense it's crazy yeah it, it was crazy i i had a great memory of him he was playing something in the makeup trailer and uh it was this sort of folk music and i remember looking at him in the trailer and going when the hell are you going to stop playing this tippity tippity tum music which i later found out was the soundtrack <laughs> <laughs> took a clockwork orange but he was playing that and he goes you want me to turn it off i said yeah pick a better song so he picks uh bohemian rhapsody so my first memory of him is headbanging to bohemian rhapsody <laughs> in the makeup trailer you know and the whole trailer just sort of going da, 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 da. and so every time i think of him that's what i think of he, he was just a he was a great guy really really great guy now also you did marry with children you did herman's head you did wings what was it like transitioning from a soap to a sitcom, because, you know, you, I know you have theater as a background, but for, with comedy on a sitcom, you know, it's, everything's in the writing, it's in the timing, it's, you can't expand, you can't do anything like that. What was, was that an easy step for you to do sitcoms? No, it was an easy step for me to do dramas. It wasn't an easy step for sitcoms, and not because I didn't like comedy. I loved it, but a lot of people say, oh, sitcoms are like theater. That is not what I think at all. I, I didn't know how they were done, so I got a pilot right out of the gate when I was 19 years old. Not a pilot. I was added on to a show called Walter and Emily uh, with Cloris Leachman. It was a very heady cast, and Brian, uh, Brian, Ke Brian Keith? Brian Keith? Do I Brian Keith, Brian Ke yeah. And um, it was it was a really, yeah, like a heady cast, and it was a Whit Thomas show. I didn't know several things. Uh, I had no warning going in. So I did the table read, and I did what I had done in the theater, which is just sort of like read your lines. Like you're just sort of marking your lines, and it's very casual. It's not casual when you're doing a sitcom. You're supposed to sell it at the table, which I didn't know until the director came up to me and went, what happened to the girl at the audition? And I went, I'm so, what? 
And he goes, you have to sell this every time you do it. I didn't know that on day two, you're doing a run through for producers where they mark whether or not your jokes are hitting and whether they have to be rewritten. Day three, you're doing it for the studio. Day four, you're doing it for the network. I didn't know the intense amount of pressure at these network run throughs. I didn't know that that's how it worked. Um, so, you know, quite, I, honestly, I, I mean, I was terrible in that first one because I just didn't know what I was doing. And one of the people who helped me was the guy that played my boyfriend on that episode, who was David Schwimmer. Uh, and he was playing my tattooed, he was playing a, a biker who was a tattoo <laughs> artist. And uh, I just remember he had been new to sitcoms, but not as new as I was. And he sort of told me, you know, this is how it works. So uh, not a bad teacher. So I got, uh, I got better at that. And I ended up liking it, but so many actors talk about how relaxing that job is. And I think, yeah, maybe year three or four, but man, those run throughs, like, you know, with the whole network looking at you and, and talking about whether or not the joke landed or not. I, it's uh, it, it's not it, it isn't what I thought going in for sure. Well, you work, you know, you, you, you're one of those people that you look at, especially when you look at IMDb, you've been on a lot of great shows, you know, and you're working. And even after the soap opera, you were constantly working. But then Brotherly Love comes about and, and that's probably gets you to a whole new crowd because, you know, Joey Lawrence, woo, you know, everyone's crazy. How is that? Because we, I guess you were a series regular and that must be great to know where you you don't have to audition. You have a home, basically. You sit there and go, okay, I can stay in L.A. and I can go. I mean, how is it being a regular on that show? Because the girls well, must have think, been going crazy. Well, I'd done something called Pigsty the year before that for two guys that uh, were writers on Cheers. And it was on UPN, the short-lived UPN. So that was 13 episodes. And I remember at the time thinking, remember every moment of this because you never know like if this will ever happen again. And it was a sitcom. And uh, thank God I'd done it because that was incredible training to do 13 episodes. And also to do it, like, with all respect to UPN, like six people were watching. So <laughs> it was a really safe space to learn what the hell I was doing. So I went straight from that where I played uh, the building super who, you know, like my first scene, I was wearing flipped over uh, overalls and I was carrying a wrench and fixing a sink. And uh, I was like, oh my God, I'm like, the, I get to be the new Joel Polnicek, like from, you know, from Facts of Life. Like this is, and I thought, great, nothing feels better than that. So then I went from that to playing a mechanic on Brotherly Love. And uh, I was really happy because, you know, like I said, I, I got, uh, it was sort of like a, a an in-depth class in sitcoms. And then when I got on Brotherly Love, I'd never worked with like teenage heartthrobs before. So I remember so clearly, you know, you go out and they announce the cast before you do the taping and people would go ape shit. They would yell, Joey, 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 Matt, 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 Andy, Andy, Andy. And then there'd be one lone dude in the audience who would be like, Lou, which was my character. <laughs> and I always thought, there's my dude. Like I, I would have one fan in the audience, which just made me laugh. And then of course, when, you know, Joey and I would kiss and then people, ooh, it was very funny. It was a very funny experience. What's it like when that you were on that show for a bunch of episodes, when you leave and that other pilot you mentioned, what's it like when you, I mean, the series you're on, what's it like when you find out it's going to end? Does it, what's it do mentally to you? Because You've someone, you're someone who worked, so you know you'll get work, but is it something that you sit there and go, damn, this sucks. Like, I was getting a weekly check, and I didn't have anything to worry about, and I could steal nature granola bars from Crafty, and I could do all that good stuff. I mean, what is it like and for someone, you were young at the time, mentally, what does that do to you? Uh, it, you know, there's a hubris of youth. It's not like, you know, you just figure, okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm, I'm working at it. Uh, I've taken more classes than I can name. I've been working my butt off and you think I will work again. So there's not, for me, there was no fear involved. Um, some were harder to say goodbye to than others. I did something called Maximum Bob and that was hands down my favorite show to work on. Still to this day, it breaks my heart. It didn't go longer. I mean, it had Bo Bridges. Uh, it had Sam Robards, Kirsten Warren. Um, it just, and the directors that came in, it, it, well, Barry Sonnenfeld directed the pilot. He was one of the producers and it was based on an Elmore Leonard novel. Like it had everything. And I think 99.9% .9 of us involved with that show, I know this in fact, because I'm still friends with a lot of them, say it's the best job we've ever had. So if I had to pick one, that one broke my heart. What, just made, it, because I, what made it so great? Um, 
for me personally, I'd never, I had never been uh, the quarterback on a show. I was 24 when we shot the pilot. I was 25 when it went to series. I, everything was seen. It was sort of like Northern Exposure. So it was about my character who was a young public defender going to Florida. And it was all seen through her eyes. I was sort of the eyes of normalcy while she went into this really strange world down in Florida. And I'd never done that before. I was in practically every scene in the pilot. And to be honest, you don't know if you can do it till you do it. And I did it. And so it meant the world to me uh, from a confidence level because it was like, damn straight, I can I can shoulder a series. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's a huge thing to learn about yourself. And it's a huge thing to feel comfortable with. The cast was extraordinary. Like I said, Bo Bridges is a dream to work with. Um, the scripts were fantastic. It was quirky. If it had been on a streaming network 10 years, 15 years later, I think it would have run for a very long time. It's a weird show. I'm attracted to very odd shows. Like there was a string of series that I did that went for six episodes. And I think all, well, most, if not all of them would have had a life 10 years later. They just were a little too weird at the time. Now you're in a tick too. Tell me about the tick. Well, the tick was awesome because it's impossible. To, you can't be depressed when you're wearing a superhero costume. Like, I remember specifically that uh, we were a bit scattered politically at the time. I mean, it wasn't as polarizing as it is now, obviously. But we would get in political discussions, and it never got contentious because you can't yell at each other while you're wearing a cape. So, like, you know, you're talking about foreign policy, and then you're like, we look ridiculous. I have a star on my chest. Like, what? You know, everything's funny in a superhero costume. Eating a sandwich looks funny in a superhero costume. So there was just that. It was sort of a baseline of absurdity. Um, and, again, the cast was really wonderful. Uh, I loved working with all three of them. And Patrick's costume was... He had to be wheeled out on this thing with, like, oxygen. He, he, it was such a tight costume. He'd take the headpiece off at the end of the day and steam would rise up. And he had to have air pumped in so that he didn't pass out. Like, what he went through in that costume was so crazy that the rest of us just uh, unilaterally decided we'd never complain. So, because we had it easy compared. And so, you know, we just wanted to make sure Patrick was okay and... Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a really cool experience. We, <laughs> it was funny though, because we went to the upfronts, uh, which is the big advertising thing in New York and, um, the network was like, okay, you have to do it in costume. And we were going, so we're doing the upfronts in costume and they go, now be careful because you're going to cross the street from the waiting area. And then we're going to send you in and you're going to cross the stage and say hi to the advertisers, but you're going to get mobbed when you cross this street. So we're going to have guards there. We're going to have, and show had not yet. And so they're like, you're going to get mobbed. So we walk outside and there's nobody, there's <laughs> nobody, nobody cared. And so we're just four schmucks of superhero costumes crossing the street to go to the upfronts. And then we had to go to the parties after that, like dressed as superheroes, which was also funny. Um, but uh, yeah, it was cool. I got an action figure. So that was, that was kind of the best. Can't be dead. Now then NCIS, I mean, CSI, I keep calling it NCI. There's so many of them. My wife watches like every show and we have so much in the DVR and it's like she watches this and this and this and uh, CSI. That comes along now in the beginning, you're recurring, right? You're not a regular. Yeah. So so what is it like to be recurring? Do you know when they're going to call you or do they say in the beginning of the season, okay, Liz, we have like 12 episodes. I mean, how does that work when you started on the show and how did you build up to becoming a regular? Uh, it was a little bit like dating. They, they were like, look, we're calling you in for one, probably two episodes. If it all goes well, we'll see what happens. And this is what they did with all the lab techs. They would sort of like, you know, you audition while on the job. So uh, I had my first scene with Marg Helgenberger, which if anybody ever ends up on a series, I would suggest working with her on your first day because she could, we're still friends to this day. I absolutely adore her. And she was great and welcoming and all the good things. So uh, I had a great first day. Second episode I did with Billy, who was also really lovely. And then they call after that and they're like, hey, we'd like you to do some more. At which point my agents were like, can you put a number on that? Like how many episodes? So we at least know that, you know, if she's going to skip out on other auditions to do this. Like we at least know that we have a baseline of how many episodes she'll get. So they said 10. So I had 10 episodes my first season. And then honestly, again, it's sort of like dating. The second somebody else wants you, you become far more attractive to the person that has you. I had a screen test lined up for a new pilot. And uh, and that made them sort of, you know, offer the ring. They basically were like, well, don't do it. Don't don't go do that pilot. We want to keep you here. So uh, it was a very gradual experience, which was lovely because I'd been in the audition circuit for so long that to be able to audition on the job and get to know the people and get to sort of set up a life there and then have them go stay. You fit in. Stay was uh, a great way to have it happen. How did you how did you end up getting to write a script? 
Noreen Shankar, who was one of the executive producers at the time, um, a couple things. Like, I have always had an ear for dialogue because I've been doing it for such a long time. And so I would ask him if I could tweak some stuff occasionally, with all due respect to the writers who were great. Uh, I thought it would be fun to have sort of a flirtation, like Wally and I thought it would be fun to have a flirtation. We, you know, there were little things that we kind of asked to put little touches of humanity. And I would write him emails, and the emails made him laugh. And so at one point, I don't know what put it in his head, but at one point we were doing the DVD commentary, and I remember specifically walking out into the parking lot after doing it, and Noreen stopped me, and he said, your emails make me laugh. How would you like to write an episode based on your characters? You'll co-write it with Wally, and it'll be based on the Lab Rats. And I remember saying yes before I could say no. Like, I thought, you know, I have to do this. What I didn't expect was to love it so much. Like, I didn't expect to love sitting in the writer's room, breaking the story, learning to outline the story. Um, I'd written some things on my own before that. I'd always been interested, and Lord knows I'd read a lot of scripts. So some of it had seeped in by osmosis. I'd taken some writing classes. Uh, like I said, I sat in in that writer's room and, and soaked it up like a sponge. But um, I just loved it. I loved every single bit of that experience. And so it radically changed uh, my my own professional path from, from then on because I just wanted to keep doing it. It just felt like a different way to be creative. Now, when you left the show, did you know it was coming? No. So, no. so what happens there? Like you're just sitting there, and I know you become a series regular, and it must be the best feeling because you've worked your ass off. You got the right. It must be such a good feeling. What happened? Because you know, as I talked to my wife, she's like, "I loved her character, and people loved her character." Thanks. Uh, it look, it sucks. You know, it sucks at the time. I my overall belief in life is that sometimes a great big boot has to come out of the sky and kick you in the ass into the next chapter of your life. You know, there's certain situations that you might stay in very long because they're comfortable and it may not be what is best for you. So that's my overall meta view of it. Like I think, you know, I, I think it ultimately was for the best at the time. I was furious, you know, like I, I remember my manager had called to make sure that I was going to be, uh, you have to see if your options picked up every year. So he called before I went on a trip to Germany, um, like a, a vacation with my husband and he called and he was like, yeah, you're fine. You're coming back. They might let you write another episode. Awesome. So we go on vacation. I come back, I get a call from my manager. Actually, they're letting you go. What? Um, and uh, you know, I, Sometimes a lot of things go on behind the scenes that uh, people just don't know about. Um, you know, at the time, I was like, what did I do? I showed up on time. People liked me. I knew all my lines. I was a professional. Like, I never raised any trouble. And I, you know, like, that doesn't make any sense. But uh, what a lot of people didn't see is that a lot of, quite a few people were let go at the same time behind the scenes. Uh, certain writers, certain producers. There was a big shakeup. And um, sometimes you're on one team or the other. And I was in the team that ended up going out the door. Uh, all I can say is that there were some people of uh, incredible talent, and I thought, well, if they're out of here too at the same time, at least I'm in good company. So once again, it's bad timing, you know, people are out. Two and a half men, tell me about what happened on that, because I hear so many things about Charlie Sheen, and I hear he's such a, he was a great guy. That's what I hear. I hear he's very, no one, no one hears about all the charities work he does and that stuff everyone just hears about his you know briefcase full of cocaine and it's really sad because he's that show I am, even when you watch reruns that show is a funny show but what happened when you doing that show um you know i'd done one in season one i had done uh i'd worked for chuck Lorre several times chuck has been very very good to me with work and i'm, I'm really grateful for that so i'd done one in season one and met charlie early on and really liked him. Uh, and that was, like I said, season one. And I think when I went back, God, I think, what was it, like season eight, ten? It was much, much later. So I didn't even know if Charlie would remember me. I was going back as a different character. And I liked him in season one very much. I mean, he was incredibly human. Like, he, he came up and even said, uh, I'm sorry if I didn't talk too much the first day. Table reads are hard for me. I'm not used to doing comedies. Like, just really human and vulnerable and cool. Um I'll preface this by saying that I believe all people have dark and light sides. Uh, with Charlie, I never saw the dark side. I'm not denying that it's there. I'm just saying he was great to me at work, which is, you know, the entirety of my relationship with him. Um, I walked in to do the character of Michelle, like, much later on. It was right after I'd left CSI. 
Charlie saw me from across the room, comes running over and gives me a hug and welcomes me back. And is like, I'm so happy you're here. He was a fan of CSI. Uh, he saw my goodbye episode while we were shooting episodes of Two and a Half Men, stood up and told everybody that he thought I was great in it. Like, I mean, really, really good guy. Uh, a joy to work with. Uh, just a consummate professional as far as his work in those scenes. I, I honestly couldn't have enjoyed working with him more, which is one of the reasons why Chuck had wanted me to stay longer because we, we just got along I don't know what this says about me, but Charlie and I got along like a house on fire. I mean, I just like, I like to the point where he was writing a short movie, a short film. And he was like, will you star in it? Like, will you come do this with me? And I thought, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but sure, sure, sure. It did. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I loved it. I never felt any of the drama between uh, him with Chuck either. Like it really was for me personally and in, in my small role in it, I, it was uh, nothing but joy. And also, P.S., John Cryer is one of the nicest human beings on the planet. I've heard. So before you took your pie, this 2019, when you wrote Concentrating Ring, you did a show called Riley Para. Para? Mm -hmm. Para. Tell me about that. Um, it was fun. It was with some people that I'd worked with before doing another web series, and they said... Uh, they said, do you want to come and do this? You know, here, here is the role. It's sort of a supernatural thing. Here is the cast. And I, I did it. I guess the biggest reason I did it, I wanted to keep my toe in the acting pool enough to know that I could still do it. Like, I just, I feel like, okay, I know it's like riding a bicycle, but you occasionally want to get on the bike just to make sure that it's still comfortable. So I wanted to go do something that felt very low pressure and wasn't, uh, a big new series that I had to go through pilot season to get so that wasn't taking me away from my writing. Uh, I just wanted to go have fun on a set. Cause like I said, you know, after doing the acting for so long, it had stopped being fun for a bit. So this was just a, an excuse to go have fun. And I did. Um, so, you know, I'm grateful to it for that. Now, did you have fun on a million little things? Cause that's a good, on, that's a great ensemble cast. And uh, these last seasons, I mean, right? this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm going to clean up doing the right. last season of all these big shows. Like, because I, it's, I, I basically am concentrating on the writing. So I don't want to become a series regular really, unless it's something spectacular. So I'm like, all right, I'll just go do the last season. I'm in, I'm out. How fun. Um, and, uh, and everybody's chilled out by the last season anyway. So they're always nice sets. Uh, yeah, Million Little Things was great because I'd done a pilot with DJ Nash 20 years prior where I played his wife, and uh, he had to act. And he says he was horrible. He was not horrible. He was better than I was when I'd done my first sitcom by far. Um, but he, he always talks about how terrible he was. But we got along really well. And he was talking about us writing something together. And I was very flattered. I met him for lunch. And then he said, now what would it take to get you in front of the camera again? And I, I said, dude, I, I'll do it. I don't want to audition and just a good role. I, you know, I'll do it. Uh, I'd, I'd be honored. And so uh, unlike a lot of people in this business, he did what he said. And within a month, I would say, he I, I, he just called me up because I got a role for you. And I, I'm, okay. So uh, I went up and uh, I did two of them. And um, I worked with David on that. Like I, I love his character on the show and I, he was who I worked with the whole time. And I had a great time. Like that was, uh, it was very important because it was the first time in a long time I had gone to work on a network television show. And I really wanted, like it had more weight for me than it probably should have just cause I was like, all right, we'll see if I still like this or if I like it again. And I did, uh, I, I had a, a really, really fun time. Now, NCIS Los Angeles, as my wife said, uh, we thought she was good, but she isn't, your character. And I remember because you posted about it, and I walked out, and she was watching it, and I go, as, as Liz Vosby, oh, she's shooting a gun. Now, <laughs> what is, I mean, how, because of what happened, how is it when you, is, is did you actually shoot a, a fake gun, or did they do, I mean, what happens? Uh, well, I mean, it's, I, I, it wasn't done in post, you know, it was a real gun, not with, uh, but it, it was uh, significantly less impact than if it had been, um, I mean, was it like a quarter charge? It was like, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the same as shooting an actual gun gun. Um, but that said, they put in blanks and there's still kick and there's still, you know, it's, it can still be dangerous. They were very careful though. Like we did an entire shootout shot separately. So I was never shooting at anybody ever, ever. Um, you know, they, they shot my side, then they shot, uh, Chris and, um, and Todd's side. 
uh, Todd being L of Cool J, which I learned on that set. Um, and uh, and so we never had guns aimed at each other. Everything was perfect. I mean, look, they've been doing it for 14 years. Like, they had it down to a system. I never felt like I was in any danger. Uh, I'd never shot an Uzi before. I played a lot of cops, so I shot a lot of handguns. I trained with people at the FBI in Washington once. I mean, like, I, I know my way around weapons. Uh, and I'm very, very, very careful when I have to do it on set. Uh, extremely careful for obvious reasons, um, but I'd never shot an Uzi before, and that was uh, that was a trip, man. That was that was crazy. My one thing was like I just don't want to close my eyes. I don't want to blink because my husband is the camera operator, and he told me about a movie star he worked with who didn't blink when she shot weapons, and I was like, I'm gonna not blink, and I didn't tell him. And then he watched the episode. He was like, Oh my god, <laughs> you didn't blink. I said, I know that was my goal, um, but yeah, I mean, most importantly, everything was. Uh, extremely extremely safe double checked triple checked and uh never never uh was anybody on the line of fire now did you do audition for that part no uh it was kind of crazy i mean i i'm like i it, it, i came back from doing uh a million little things and i thought oh well this was fun i wonder if anything else will come along and within weeks my manager called and went yeah they're offering you this uh this role in ncis la it's the last two episodes of the series and uh, and I knew I was going to have a very long scene with Gerald McCraney, which is what truly sold me. Because um, ever since he was on This Is Us, I mean, I, I, he obviously has been incredible his whole career. But something about that character just moved me so much. And I thought his work was so beautiful. And also, I sold the pilot and I'd been staring at his face through every pitch. Because in pilots, you know, sometimes you bring up pictures of people like, this is this character, think of this person. So uh, for months, I'd been like, this is this character, think Gerald McCraney. So I had looked at his face for such a long time and we sold that show. And he's what's been in my mind's eye when I wrote that character, which I told him. And, uh, and he's like, send me the script. Maybe we'll talk about me doing it. I was like, oh, my God. Um, but so, I, so it, you know, the second I saw his name, I just thought, I have to do this. I can't not go meet Gerald McCraney after talking about him all this time and, and loving his work so much. Now, do you think the writing is easier because you've done so much acting and read so many scripts? Do you think, I mean, the creativity comes from in you, but do you think the, the beats, the moments, the actual developing of a story, do you think that's easier for you now because you've acted so many times, and as you said you've read so many scripts, and you've been in, you've been on great shows. You know, you've probably been in shows you weren't happy about. You've been in movies. Everyone always says, "Oh, I love this show," or "I needed work, so I took this show." But do you think it's really helped you a lot? Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you you read a lot of scripts, you start to understand structure, and most important, find it for your own character. So you start to realize, oh, there's a through line that this character has, and when this happens and an obstacle comes up, this is what my character does. This is how she goes about doing it. So all of this seeps in, and then when you're writing it, it it sort of uh, naturally. And again, I mean, I did go take classes, and I did get very serious about doing my research. I've read every single screenwriting book that there is and took some from some and nothing from others and, you know, whatever works for me. But yeah, being an actor for so long definitely helped and definitely helped with dialogue because I know, you know, sometimes actors work with writers who are collaborative and sometimes they're not for different reasons. But the ones that I've worked with who are collaborative would take pitches for dialogue changes. So it's just something I could always hear. Like, I really feel like my character would say this now, or I feel like this line would work better out of my mouth if it had a little handle at the top, you know, even if it's as simple as, yeah, but you know, and then the line, you know, just adding a couple words to make it feel more real to me. So you do that for long enough and your ear just starts to get used to it. So uh, sitting down to write my first, it was a sitcom that I wrote first, it was a half hour comedy and it wasn't hard. I heard it, like I just heard it in my head. Um, so yeah, I'm really grateful. I, I think honestly, like I, I directing the documentary has made me a better actor. Like I think every part of the entire industry that you can try, even if it's just in a class or even if it's on your own or making a tiny little thing with your friends, I think you get better at all of it for having tried different parts of it. One final question. You've been acting since you were 16 on, on TV since you were nine, but how, and you've been in Hollywood. How has the industry in your eyes changed? Because it seems it's really changed. And I think that's why people are striking now, too, because it's changed. But it has has become as much as they say a producer's business set of, instead of the actor's business now. For you personally, how has it changed? I think it's become a corporate business more than it ever has before. I mean, the people that weigh in on your auditions are people that 
a lot of times don't have an artistic bone in their body, you know, and they're, they're, they're looking at tapes of actors and it, what it comes down to for a lot of people is how many Twitter followers do you have? How, you know, what is your online presence like? What, and, and I think it's always been a fear-based industry, but I think the fear has gotten white hot now to the point where they will cast somebody who's wrong if that person has a following before finding the people who are right. Like it used to be the television made stars. You know, you look at some of the early shows that have become huge, huge hits. Look at Friends. It's not like that cast, Courtney Cox was the most famous person out of all of them and mostly for the Bruce Springsteen video. Like it wasn't like you were taking big stars and putting them on a show to make sure that it hit. They got the most talented people and my God, did they ever, they got the most talented people for those roles and then they became stars. And I think that doesn't happen as often because I think that uh, a lot of the corporate heads behind all this, I think they look at it and they want a sure bet. Like I've actually pitched things before. I pitched a sitcom recently and they were like, oh my God, that is a really funny idea. It's a really funny idea. The feedback later was, we're not going to buy it because we don't know if it's a sure bet. And you go, what? There, there is no sure bet. And you look at all the hits now and you go, none of those are sure bets. I have it on pretty good authority that like the Ted Lasso thing, it, it got made, look at who was behind it, but nobody thought it was going to hit the way that it hit. It, it hit because we needed it as a society. We needed just, you know, an IV of optimism. And so it hit exactly at the right time. So it's just such bullshit to hear that they want, they want the safe choice. It's like, just go for the best choice all the time and, and see what happens. That's awesome. I, I'm glad you got to come back on. It's been six years. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Oh, social media, what's your stuff? Oh, uh, I am, the easiest place to get in touch with me is on Twitter. Um, and I'm at Liz Vassy. I know it's very difficult to remember uh, on Twitter. And I'm definitely there. I'm not leaving anytime soon just because I, I set up something every Saturday called Chatterday uh, that I did during the pandemic because I read a I read a statistic that something like a third of all Americans were going through the pandemic alone. So they were quarantined alone. And I found that just incredibly sad, uh, I, you know, how isolating. So I started asking questions every Saturday and people weigh in and they give their answers. And so I'm sticking with it because I, I have a small but mighty group that follows me for that. And um, so I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. So Twitter's probably the easiest. So people follow Liz on Twitter. Go check out her IMDb. Check out her past shows. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Cooper Talk. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. I have over 960 episodes up there. You can email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you next time.